Now, let's talk a little bit more about some different types of properties that are in uh, this area. The first one is going to be what we're going to talk about is going to be a common condominium. <laughs> I think I said going to be like five times there. I'm not sure. Probably going to be a stupid statement. So condominiums are created through this thing called a horizontal property axe. Because what that developer has to do is take that big piece of land and subdivide it into little bitty uh, sections so each person can own it. And that's called the horizontal property axe. We will talk on another chapter where we deal with legal descriptions on how that gets done. But understand that when a guy buys a 100-acre farm, he cannot sell all 100 acres. He subdivides them and builds condos on them. And he will have each one of them gets created in its own legal address so that it can be taxed and identified. So it's done through the Horizontal Property Acts. In a condominium, each owner owns fee simple. Remember that chapter? That's the degree to which they took it. They own it fee simple. And they would own their unit fee simple. And if there are common elements, they would have an ownership interest in that common elements. And let's see what kind it is. It's a tenant in common. So you buy a condo in unit A, but you get 10% interest ownership of the pool, the tennis courts, the parking lot, the uh, courtyard, and all of that. Now, understand, tenants in common, so that means they can sell it, right? And you guys know that. Hey, I saw a condo for sale. Well, if it was joint tenants, they couldn't do that because joint tenants have right of survivors. So you know that that common elements are formed as tenants in common. So I own fee simple unit A and a 10% interest in all the common area. And you can use condos for any type of properties. I have seen office condominiums where companies will buy their office inside of a building. Um, each building or each condo is its own little piece of real estate. So each one gets assessed their own real estate property taxes. And there is a condominium association or a homeowners association or an HOA that kind of runs or guides that. All right. The next one is this thing called a co-op, which we have touched on very briefly. A co-op is where the Building and the land is actually held and owned by a corporation. And all of the people that have bought into that are shareholders of that corporation. So you own shares of stock. You do not own real property. The real property is owned by the corporation and you own shares in the corporation. And you are given, and here's that word again that we've talked about, that lifetime proprietary lease that allows you to reside as a shareholder in Unit A. But if I owned 10% of the shares of stock, I would also theoretically own 10% interest in Unit B and Unit C and Unit D but I can't go walking into that other space and go, hey, I own 10%, I'm here. No, it's the interest. It is managed by the shareholders, which typically create a board to decide, hey, we need a quote for lawn care to mow the lawn. Hey, we need a quote because we're gonna put a new roof on in 10 years, so we're gonna have to assess ourselves some money to start doing that. Shareholders are going to pay those fees for that, and they could get uh, assessed of another fee. 
we're going to put a roof on the property, so we're going to assess all the shareholders an extra $1,000 a year so that in the next five years, we'll have enough money put away so that when we get a new roof put on our building, we'll have the money. Here's the problem or the downside, in my opinion, downside, to the co-op. If you've got a fellow shareholder that for some reason all of a sudden cannot pull his financial weight, that means his portion is going to have to get paid by somebody because you need to pay the bill. You guys get what I'm saying? If a tax bill comes in for $10,000 and all 10 of you guys go, okay, I got my $1,000, that would be $10,000. And one of the guys goes, hey, I don't have $1,000, uh, I'm broke. That doesn't mean you get to pay $9,000 to the bill and go, hey, get it. No, they're still going to say, we want the ten grand, And now the other nine people have got to pony up and go, oh, shit, now I own 11, I owe, you know, $1,111 because we got to cover the one dude that didn't have money. So because of that, that does allow shareholders to kind of scrutinize the sale to another person. So when a person wants to sell their unit, they would actually sell shares of stock to that person who would become now a new stockholder and he would get the proprietary lease in whatever person that just left. But the thing is that now this ability, because of this requirement about the default falling on the rest of the people here, they actually could have a clause that says, hey, we get to financially approve whoever you want to sell your stock shares to so that we don't get caught in a situation of you selling it to some bozo that really doesn't have a lot of money. So when we have a capital call for the roof, we want to make sure he's going to be able to have that thousand so we're not covering for him. <clears throat> so that board can, in essence, direct or guide or nullify the sale of those shares of stock. That seems kind of minor until you start thinking that there becomes a very great way for that board to manipulate who buys. Oh man, we don't want him to buy. They don't belong to the right yacht club. Or Lord forbid, if they said they're the wrong religion or the wrong color. So it does get kind of questionable here and there where that board has that power to deny the sale of shares of stock because they have to meet a certain financial guideline. The last one I want to talk about is a timeshare. A timeshare is actually ownership of a property in a small increment of time. Usually they are done through the same process where it's a fee simple, but it may not be the fullest extent because there are limitations on what you can do. I own a fee simple timeshare and my deed literally says the 44th week of the year, which is right around that first month of November time frame. All right. So for that week, I own the property fee simple, but I don't get full control. I don't get absolute because I can't go in and knock a wall down and go, hey, I want to expand the, make an eat in kitchen because next week it's going to be somebody else. So there is usually a document that says what rights they're transferring to you, like possession. I have the right to possess it that week. I have the right of quiet enjoyment. Nobody's going to come and bother me. But my control is going to be very limited. I probably can't go in and even paint the walls. Guess I could paint them on Monday and paint them back on Friday. All right? And you do that, and most states 
actually have specialized laws for timeshare. I know Florida has some huge timeshare laws that are uh, very restrictive down there because it is very common. As a matter of fact, (laughs) that's where my timeshare is, down in Florida. All right? So that is how timeshares work, and they are regulated or created or subdivided by the original developer that is going to sell these and create this timeshare type of scenario. All right? Now, I know we went through this kind of quick, so I want to remind you, if you guys have questions, feel free to reach out to me at my email. It's raymond at realuniversity.com. And go back and re-listen. Don't forget, there are questions in the book. There are questions in online that you can do. So go through those and practice. And if you have other questions, feel free to reach out to me. All right?